What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kafinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guest in this episode of Hidden Forces is Megan O'Giblin. Megan is an author and essayist who writes on matters of philosophy and religion for The New Yorker, Harper's Magazine, The Guardian, Wired, and elsewhere. In the first hour of our conversation, Megan shares her personal journey growing up in a fundamentalist Christian community. She talks about the disillusionment she experienced upon leaving the faith, her forays into transhumanism and other alternative theories of consciousness, and what she thinks is really going on. What is the nature of reality? Is consciousness fundamental to the universe? And what happens to us when we die? In the second hour, we apply many of the ideas discussed in the first part of our conversation to contemporary life. We examine what it means to live in a digitally intermediated and surveilled society with its effects on free will and the sanctity of interior experience. We also consider what philosophy can tell us about the advancements being made in artificial intelligence, why this technology is unlike anything else that human beings have previously created, and why its development and unrestricted application puts at risk not only our lives, but our humanity. If you want access to that part of the conversation and you're not already subscribed to Hidden Forces, you can join our premium feed and listen to the second hour of today's episode by going to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe. All of our content tiers give you access to our premium feed, which you can listen to on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. If you want to join in on the conversation and become a member of the Hidden Forces Genius Community, which includes Q&A calls with guests, access to special research and analysis, in-person events, and dinners, you can also do that on our subscriber page. And if you still have questions, feel free to send an email to info at hiddenforces.io, and I or someone from our team will get right back to you. And with that, please enjoy this thoughtful and timeless conversation with my guest, Megan O'Giblin. Megan O'Giblin, welcome to Hidden Forces. Thanks so much for having me. It's my pleasure to have you on, Megan. So I was telling you right before we turned on the microphone that I discovered your book probably while I was perusing Amazon. I do that every so often to kind of introduce randomness into how I find guests. And it had a really great title, God, Human, Animal, Machine. You know, who doesn't love that? It has everything thrown in there together. And it's a topic, you know, I used to do a lot of, I had David Chalmers on, who you cite in the book. I had David Weinberger on. I had Ray Monk on, who wrote Wittgenstein's biography and and a bunch of other philosophers. But much more in the earlier days of the show, we did also more tech-focused shows then. Recently, I've been drawn back into the field. And what I think is so wonderful about this book, and then I'm going to shut up and I'm going to start asking you questions. What I love about it is it feels like you're dealing with the timeless questions that really have no answer, my opinion, or no sort of rational brain answer. We can't necessarily think our way to God is sort of my view of this. But you're thinking about these timeless questions that have concerned philosophers forever, but you're doing it in a modern sense, using modern metaphors, grappling with those metaphors. And I think in some sense, trying to give us a new, whether you're doing it intentionally or not through your exploration of this, because it is in in many ways an exploration, giving us a, a sort of language to talk about it. And so I'm I'm excited to explore that with you today. Normally, I don't spend too much time on a guest's biography, but your biography is kind of part of the book. Your upbringing is part of the book. In fact, also, your dog Ibo, which is a robotic dog, which you had in your house, is a kind of literary device that you use in the book. So I would love to understand you. Sort of talk to me about your early life, and when did you begin to think about these questions? Or did you not really think about them much because... You grew up in a fundamentalist home where you already sort of thought you had the answers from an early age. Yeah, I would call my upbringing fundamentalist. We didn't use that word when I was growing up. We called ourselves Christians, followers of Christ. But my parents very much believed that the Bible was the literal and inerrant word of God. We were, I, I was come from a big family. I'm the oldest of five kids. We were all homeschooled up until high school. 
And everything that we learned as children came to us filtered through this worldview. We, you know, all of our textbooks for homeschooling were from a Christian wholesale company. So we learned the six day creation story. We were taught flood geology, the notion that the universe was about 6,000 years old. So it was a unique way to, to grow up. And, you know, when I, I tell people today, I, I grew up evangelical, people often say like, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. <laughs> you know, like it was this traumatic experience, but it was actually a really wonderful way to grow up in some ways, as peculiar as it was. You know, my family was very close. We uh, ate dinner, you know, together every night as a family. And basically everything in our world was oriented toward faith and, and religion. And yeah, those big questions were front and center. You know, they were things that, you know, our pastor talked about it at church. What does it mean to be human? You know, do we have free will? What is the nature of immortality going to look like? You know, what is the soul? Um, and, you know, they were, they were also questions that we debated. There's a lot of debate within Christianity about those topics. And when I was 18 years old, I, I studied theology for two years at Moody Bible Institute which is a fundamentalist uh, institution in Chicago that was founded by the evangelist Dwight L. Moody in the 19th century, very old Christian school. Everybody there was planning to go into full-time ministry, so it was a very rigorous academic environment. And it was while I was at Moody that I started diving a little bit more rigorously into those questions and also having a lot of doubts about them. So there were, you know, parts of the Bible that I had never been exposed to until I, I was studying, you know, the Old Testament, the New Testament in detail. And that was really the beginning of the unraveling of my faith. You know, I had a lot of questions about hell, divine justice, you know, the problem of predestination, all of these things led in a confluence to the my eventually leaving the faith. Did you have any doubts before you went to college? Could it have been that you were suppressing them or did you not have any doubts at all? It's a tricky question to answer, you know, because I, I think, yeah, if I was suppressing them, I probably was not aware of them. I mean, what we were taught as Christians is that doubts are part of being a believer. And doubt is a, a component of belief and that every every believer doubts at some point. So there's a way in which whatever sort of objections I had were for a long time, you know, they were normalized as part of this as part of the experience and it's human to doubt that's part of our fallen nature. But there was a point at which it became clear to me, you know, that my my doubts were different from those of other Christians or maybe it was, you know, sometimes it seemed like I just had more of a need for answers. Other people were content with not having certain questions or objections answered. And for me, the most frustrating thing, especially when I was at, at Moody studying theology, was you know being told like, well, you know, these questions are things that God knows, but our brains are are too puny as humans. We're never going to understand them. And for me, that was an unsatisfying answer. I don't know what I think. I think a little bit mm. differently about it today. But yeah, at the time, that was sort of the end point for me. I feel like for most people, their doubts circle the wagon of plausibility. You know, how likely is that there is a God, putting aside kind of what God is. I'm not sure entirely how much your doubts centered on that and how much it's centered on a sense of injustice around the nature of the divine being that you were being told was omnipotent and which sat at the center of the universe. So what was the source of your doubt, or what was the reason that you ultimately came to leave the faith? Yeah, it was absolutely a, a moral and ethical nature. That was the nature of my doubt. You know, and it's unusual because I think you're right, like a lot of people who end up, you know, who grow up religious and end up leaving their faith do so for that plausibility reason that, you know, the scripture claims, you know, miracles or, you know, some sort of metaphysical reality that there's just no evidence for that's unscientific. And I don't know why that question never bothered me just because I thought, well, you know, if there is a God, if you take this belief system on its own terms, he can intervene into the physical world and, and make anything happen, you know? So, there was also the fact that I was, you know, I grew up around many first person accounts of miracles and miraculous events. That was part of our faith, too. You know, people, you know, who claim to have heard God's voice, who have, you know, seen angels, had various encounters that just couldn't be explained. And they were, you know, fairly trustworthy accounts, at least to my mind as a kid. How big are these communities 
And how big was your community that you, you were in? You know, I went to, my, my parents belonged to a few churches growing up and they were typically, you know, when I was younger, we went to sort of small mainline churches that were maybe 200 congregants or so. Mm-hmm. When I was in high school, it was in the late 90s when the mega church era was really exploding. So I went to some churches that had like, you know, more like a thousand members. We also, my parents belonged to, uh, we went to a Bible camp every summer that was a really tight-knit Christian community of about 100 families Mm. on Lake Michigan. And so a lot of our, you know, my whole extended, not just my immediate family, my whole extended family were born-again Christians, aunts and uncles, cousins, and all of the, you know, family friends that we knew from this Bible camp were also believers. So I was very much immersed in that community and didn't really have access to a lot of, you know, diversity of viewpoints beyond it. So I was telling you before we uh, turned on the microphone that I found your book weirdly comforting. And it's a weird thing to say because in some sense, it's so obviously not comforting to kind of stare into the abyss. And we can kind of get into what that means and and whether that is an abyss and whether that's just a subjective interpretation. But I went through a period in my 20s where I experienced profound existential despair and anxiety, which resonated I mean, your experience resonated with what I went through, but I came from a very different place than you did. You decided to, I guess, drop out after the second year. Is that the correct way of thinking of it? Yeah. Walk me through that journey. Explain to me sort of what, because that must have been so scary. What must have confronted you there was not just this disillusionment with the faith and your understanding of God and what you believed, that your whole system of belief that you had your whole life but also you were thrust into uncertainty around your life and your life's purpose and what the rest of your life would look like. You kind of went into a wandering phase, it seems like. So walk me through how that happened. I'm curious to understand more about it. It did feel like, it did feel like a trauma in some sense. I mean, it's, I don't think I realized how affected I was at the time by losing that. I mean, for one thing, losing the belief in God, And that whole worldview, this whole idea that life has meaning, an intrinsic meaning to it, but also losing the community that I was a part of. You know, I I spent several years, I was living, I I lived in Chicago afterwards and I was, you know, just after I left Moody, I was bartending and waitressing for several years. And really, I guess, mourning the loss of that system of faith I always say to when you lose your faith in the 21st century, it's basically you experience the whole process of secularization that you know the West experienced over many centuries. You know the loss, the death of God, the end of history, the modernist decay of meaning, postmodern death of absolutes, all of that in just a moment. And for me, the most disorienting thing was the sense that time wasn't moving forward. Because mm. a big part of our faith, you know, especially leading up to the millennium, was this idea that all of history was culminating toward this glorious endpoint when Christ would return and the dead would be raised and, you know, the, the believers would go to heaven and the whole human race was going to be radically transformed. And there was a sense, I think I took it for granted as a young person that there was a sense of propulsion, this sense of that, you know, history is going somewhere. And to have that disappear in a moment was really disorienting. I felt like this narrative arc had become circular. You know, I was, mm. why am I here? What am I doing? And for me, you know, I, I ended up, I was drinking a lot during that time. I had an addiction to pills. I was sort of just trying to cope with that process in, in really crude and ineffective ways. Yeah, there's a line in the book where you describe this. You say, the flow of time, which I had always experienced as linear, a river rushing forward, had pooled into a grotto where it circled and stagnated. The pointlessness of my existence would often hit me in the midst of some ordinary task, buying groceries, boarding a train, and I would become paralyzed by confusion and indecision. That resonated with me. I I had experienced that as well. I had also experienced this just kind of complete loss of faith in anything, Hmm. even in the sturdiness of the material nature of the ground beneath my feet. You know, the only thing I felt I could trust was my inner experience, that I was experiencing something, but I had no concept of what the nature of that experience was. And you know, again, like my experience, because I did find this language that you talked about so relatable, I think it was a result of not having 
of having a very materialist framework for trying to understand the nature of the world. And so I saw myself, and there were places in the book where you also use this kind of language. I mean, there's one part of the book where you talk about your reptilian brain or something. You have these moments where you kind of speak about yourself in this way, and I could never quite tell, is, is it that she believes it? She's kind of playing with it. I mean, throughout the book, it doesn't feel like you're coming down definitively on anything. You're just kind of throwing stuff out there and seeing how it feels, seeing how it lands for you and for the reader. But I felt very much like, you know, I'm just kind of this machine. And when I die, it's all over and there's nothing. And then trying to imagine this, you know, you talk about Pascalian terror and Pascal has written similar words about the sort of terror of contemplating infinite nothingness. You know, you're, you have this just burst of consciousness and then it's all over. Talk to me a little bit about what, for people that, whether they can relate to it, whether they can't, how do you sort of describe what that feeling was like for you? And are you comfortable reliving it in your mind? Or is it one of those things? Because for me, for a long time, I tried to suppress it. It's kind of one of those things that once you see it, you can't unsee it. And I just tried to push it away. And it was a constant sort of source of anxiety in my life until I found a way to sort of work through it, make peace with it, however you want to talk about what it was that I went through. But how do you describe what it was for you? It's interesting to you hear your experience because I, I associate that period of my life so much with the loss of faith. But I think mm. you're right that a lot of people go through something like that, typically in their youth or you know in their early adulthood, this sense of what is it all for? And yeah, that sort of Pascalian terror of how small your life is and you know, does it have any meaning? Are we just machines? And then, yeah, what happens after that? I don't know, I guess we get busy with more practical matters and, and I think a lot of people kind of push it aside, but it is, it is sort of this abyss that's always there in the periphery. And you know, if it wasn't for the fact that I became a writer and had the opportunity to explore those ideas through my work, I don't know that I would have returned to them necessarily because, you know, I'm sort of the same where I, these questions are very much in the peripheral of my everyday life. But yeah, writing about them, it's interesting. It kind of took me back to that period of wanting to get to the bottom of everything, mm -hmm. which is a, a hard thing because what, you know, what is there at the bottom? I think when you ask those big questions, what does it mean to be human? Am I a machine? You know, do I have, is there some sort of something else besides just neurons firing? There's not really any easy answers to those questions. And I think part of my motivation writing the book was feeling like, Maybe I'll get to the bottom of that or find out, you know, somebody, uh, maybe I'll encounter some sort of theory or some, you know, way of thinking about it that gives me a way to move forward or that is more comforting or tenable. But what I discovered, at least about midway through the book, I think it became clear, like nobody knows the answers to these questions. Like I wrote so many books about consciousness and theory of mind, and it's just the most perplexing question in science today. And there's so many different theories that are attempting to make sense of it, to try to fit it into the you know physicalist view of the world. But none of them are really definitive or, or mm. satisfying. Did you ever question your own sanity during this process? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Isn't that a common experience? And I wonder if it isn't just I mean, I think it's real, if you want to know the truth. I think that, in, and that's where we get to the fuzzy line between like, is that kind of insanity just a reflection of just how insane the world is and what we know and what we don't know, what, how little we actually know about what is and is not real? I had the experience of being able to just, if I was hyper-rational, I got to a place of feeling like I was losing my mind. That's interesting. So you, you feel like rationalism leads to insanity in some sense? Yes. I'll put it to you this way. I had this ambitious idea when I was a young man that if I read enough philosophy that I could reason my way to God, mm. that I could reason my way to the answers, these timeless questions. I thought I could figure it out. Yeah. And I think that that reflects a sort of youthful ambition. And I, I think that that's not possible. And in fact, what's also interesting to me is as someone who didn't read Aquinas or Augustine. You know, I relate to Augustine. I mean, I've read some stuff, but I didn't study them. I relate very much to Augustine's idea that all we need to do in order to understand or be in contact with the elemental truth of the world or the mystery is to look inwards. I actually, that deeply resonates with me 
at this stage in my life. What doesn't resonate with me is that somehow God resides in the rational mind. Mm. That feels like a trap. Mm -hmm. And I've talked about this before in this show. I wonder though, perhaps if at the time that Augustine wrote that, reason was more embodied maybe mm. than it is today. And so, because I think that there's a sense in which truth resides somewhere closer to our hearts, somewhere inside of ourselves, not up here. And maybe what's happened is that we've become so disembodied today that when we reason through things, we go so far afield. I'm curious, does that resonate with you at all? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it's interesting. Augustine, yeah, definitely believed in reason, but for him, reason was essentially the imago Dei. It was the image of God in man. So it was something that was, it wasn't this sort of disembodied logical reasoning that we think about today. It was something closer to intuition. It was something that was a little bit you know, this very much influenced by this platonic idea that, you know, there is some sort of absolute truth in the universe and that that's expressed through the logos, through this divine image in humans. And yeah, I think today we have this legacy of dualism that's often attributed to Descartes, where we have the separation of mind and body. And I think we think about our minds in a way that's a lot more distrustful or skeptical. In the sense that, you know, what is the mind? You know, it's not part of material reality. We can't weigh it or <laughs> measure it in any way. And yet it's the instrument through which all of reality comes to us, you know? So, I mean, I, I definitely identify with what you said about, you know, and maybe this is part of the, the Christian legacy in my own life, but this, you know, Augustinian idea that you can look within to find truth it's hard to say what that means. It's hard to defend mm. what that means. I think maybe the idea you're alluding to, I, you know, I've heard a lot about this sort of in the air too, this idea that our bodies have knowledge. We have some sort of an unconscious knowledge or, you know, that we have picked up from our environment. There's a way you can account for it scientifically. But yeah, I, I think that that's common to, to have a little bit more distrust toward disembodied reason. There's a girl that's a friend of yours that you talk about in the book. We all have friends like this. You actually say we all have friends like this. And there's a line, I loved it. I read it out to my wife. I loved it so much. Because I think this is kind of what you're getting at. She's the kind of person that believes this. Is, this. is this accurate that she has this sort of sense? And she says, but like many faith systems, her beliefs are completely self-contained and defensible by their own logic. Once when I made this point, she smiled at me and said, of course, you're an Aquarius. <laughs> and I <laughs> yeah. love that so much. And that kind of speaks to, so I think not to give voice or validity to any particular spiritual practice or sort of way of being in, in relationship to the mystery, but I do, I think that it's so interesting. We live in this hyper-materialist society. And my, materialist, for listeners, I don't mean consumerism. I mean materialist in terms of philosophically materialist, a belief that we can ultimately understand all the, the foundations of the world using science and that we are ultimately, and consciousness can be explained through science and through the material parts that constitute it or give birth to it. I don't know if emergence falls within the category of materialism. I assume it does, but yeah. it kind of hand waves away the fact that this thing that's emerging is somehow immaterial. Yeah. Something I was thinking about when you were, I don't know if this is off topic, but when you were talking about how reason leads to insanity, I was thinking about the Dostoevsky novel, The Brothers Karamazov, mm. which I, I actually read in, in Bible school and was really a crucial part of my my leaving the faith. But, you know, ironically, Ivan, who's like the atheist brother, believes in reason, believes in science, and tries to you know, object to his brother, Alyosha is the monk. He's sort of fighting with him throughout the book about the existence of God. And Ivan is the one who who ends up totally insane at the end. Um, you know, and I think that that was Dostoevsky's idea is that reason, you know, folds in on itself at a certain point. You get to something that you can't explain. And yeah, there's hard limits to what we can understand. Yeah, we live in this world where materialism has produced some ridiculous theories. Mm-hmm. One of which is that consciousness is an illusion. This is an example I feel like, this is almost like when Bill Clinton was being interrogated by Ken Starr and he tried to define the word is or yeah. a. It's kind of like <laughs> you've, reached the, you've reached the limits of what you can do mm -hmm. to, 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 to twist yourself into a pretzel. 
But one of the other things that comes out of this philosophy is that spiritual practices and all the things that come with religion, these are all important. They're bullshit, but they're important because they help us live and make sense because we need meaning, us dumb apes. We just need meaning. It's obviously, there's no meaning to be found, but you need to believe in something, so find your charm and, mm-hmm. and just kind of believe in it. I don't believe that. And I'm curious, so this is a good opportunity to ask you, because I said this book feels so much like an exploration, and reading your book, I think we both have a sense of humility around what is knowable. At this point in your life, through all the journeys you've been through, and through your own personal success as a person, I mean, you've gone through this difficult phase in your 20s, you were bartending, you dealt with depression. It sounds like, I don't know if you actually dealt with depression. I yeah, can't. oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm sure you had a lot of anxiety too, yeah. <laughs> dealing with these topics, it comes to the territory. You talked about alcoholism. You were very honest and sort of raw in the book and the way you spoke about it. And you've had so much success as an author, you know, meaningful success. You, Besides all the rewards, you're really accomplished. People who have had you on their programs and I've listened to a number of interviews really sing your praises. So you've gone through this process of having accomplished some things, which in itself can be, depending on where you're coming from, can feel a bit transcendent. I'm curious where you find yourself today when it comes to these questions and how you relate to the mystery, make sense of it, and sort of cope with it emotionally. I mean, the book was obviously an intellectual project, but I think on a deeper level, it was motivated by this spiritual need to push that exploration to its logical end, right? This question about I mean, it sounds stupid to say it because it was such a big question. This is like, what does it mean to be a thinking, feeling person? Why do I have experience at all? You know, if we live in a purely materialist world where, you know, there is no God, there's no sort of spiritual reality beyond just brute matter and energy, you know, why do I have first person experience? Why does the world feel meaningful occasionally to me? And I think writing the book, it really took me full circle because, you know, I'd started with this Christian answer, which is that we can't understand those things. Our minds are too small and found that really unsatisfying. And really, the book was a way to delve into the other, the completely scientific objective point of view. And and let's see how far that can take us. And, you know, this view that purports that we can understand everything about the world, that everything can be reduced to, you know, cause and effect. And got to the end of it and realized that, yeah, that's a dead end too. I mean, at almost every theory of consciousness at some point, whether it's dualism, emergentism, panpsychism, you know, reductive materialism, it ends in some sort of unanswerable problem, you know, the hard problem of consciousness, the combination problem in panpsychism. There's a point at which we just can't understand and can't get the answers to those questions. And so I guess this is a roundabout way of saying the writing of the book really took me back to that place of just accepting that, yeah, my mind is really small. We are trying to, as humans, as limited creatures, understand this world that we are a part of that's filtered through our minds, which we don't understand. Yeah, we're not gonna get answers, I don't think, to those questions, at least during my lifetime. (laughs) What do you think the reason is that you want answers to these questions? Is it, for example, a desire to understand what is actually going on right now? How much of it is that? How much of it is a desire to understand what's going to happen to you when this Mm -hmm. thing that happens to all of us is going to happen to you to deal with the Pascalian terror of sort of the infinite nothingness? Mm -hmm. What are the ultimate questions that really drive you, do you think? I mean, I think ultimately it's a really practical question, which is how how should we live? Hmm. Right? Like what, you know, I think that the thing that was really frustrating to me after I left the faith is that it seemed like a lot of people who had not grown up religious sort of just took it for granted that we get to choose, you know, choose your own adventure. You get to choose whatever life, whatever system of belief. Um, You can find meaning in whatever you find meaningful as long as you're not hurting somebody else. Mm. Um, And I was just never satisfied with that answer. Like I, I felt like we're... I mean, it really had to do with this question of like the origins of the universe. Like, why are we here? Are we here for a reason? Did somebody put us here? Am I going to be held accountable to somebody at the end of my life? 
Those aren't questions I obviously, I don't like wake up and ask myself those questions every day explicitly, but they're there in the background. And I'm sure they have something to do with, you know, questions that define my childhood that were just implicit in the way I grew up. And so, yeah, I think my, my, my need for answers is more about like, well, I can't decide anything. I don't know what I should do with my life until I know sort of the answer to that. Like, what, what does it mean to be human? Why are we mm. here? Those sorts of questions. And that's, I, I guess, what writing the book got, you know, really brought to the forefront is that those were the questions motivating the smaller intellectual questions I was asking in the book. And that those are the things that we have to decide those things for ourselves as humans. We can't, you know, d- depend on some sort of transcendent authority to give them to us, whether that's God or, you know, super intelligence of some kind. So I'm going to quote your book which speaks to what you said there. And then I want to ask you a question. I'm going to say it now so I don't forget it, which okay. the question is basically like, what does that answer to you? How do we come to a, a sense of meaning? What gives our life's meaning? This is also, I recommend to listeners, our episode with Rebecca Goldstein from several years ago on the subject of meaning. So that's definitely something that I think works with this episode. So this is a bit of a long quote. And you write, when I consider the sheer scope of the universe – That bizarre realm of wormholes and alternate dimensions that was destined for certain heat death, I felt only Pascalian terror, proof of my own insignificance. I had read enough biology and cognitive science to know that I was basically a machine, albeit a mortal one, subject to the unstoppable drama of entropy. I turned then to the existentialists who insisted that all meaning was subjective and must be forged by the individual. Life has no meaning a priori, Sartre writes in his existentialism is a humanism. It is up to you to give it meaning. But I didn't want to give life some private meaning. I wanted meaning to exist in the world. You know, I found that very relatable. And I think that a lot of people find that relatable because the relativist philosophy, this sort of postmodern, I guess it falls within the realm of postmodernism, that, you know, it's all a private morality. It's all kind of whatever float your, floats your boat, whatever makes you happy that there's no grander struggle, there's nothing larger out there that's there beyond you. I think that's deeply unsatisfying. And and my sense of it is that it's not true because it doesn't resonate deep inside of me. Now, of course, you can say, well, I'm just a meat sack and that's just you know some kind of pre-wired programming. Again, me using metaphors now. But all those ideas also come from science, which ends up being turned inwards from the observer, which isn't even objective and then attempts to investigate and draw conclusions about what's driving our psyche, where our consciousness comes from. And it's so inverted that I just don't give it any credence at all. And for me, I'm going to bring it back to the question about the nature of reality and what you think is going on here. For me, the points in my life where I've come closest to feeling like I'm most in contact with the truth, whatever that is, is either in periods of immense suffering, personal suffering, through meditation, or I had a personal experience of having really faced death. I had a brain tumor. I had uh, significant cognitive decline and dementia from it. And I was effectively resurrected. You know, that's what it felt like. I mean, after I came out of that experience, I, you know, I've written about it, but it was such a transcendent experience. And those categories of experience, profound suffering, meditation, where I can sort of deliberately create a state that feels like I just feel more connected with whatever it is that is sort of deeper and more true, or the one particular period of time that lasted several months for me. Those are the periods where I've experienced something like that. So one, you don't talk about meditation in the book. I'm curious if you've had any experiences like this. And if you had to take a stab at it, what do you think is really going on here? What is really going on in terms of like, what is the metaphysical reality? Yeah, like right now, you and I, like right now, like I find myself here, I read your book, I experienced it as some physical thing, but we know that that's highly inaccurate of what it actually Mm -hmm. is, at least what we know scientifically. I'm speaking at this microphone and there's a screen here. Who knows who you are? Who knows who I am? I mean, there's something real going on here. There's something, but Mm -hmm. it's so far removed from what our schemas are telling us it is. Mm-hmm. And we can't really know what it is. But for me, there's still... Anyway, I don't want to start saying what it is for me or what I think. I can try to. And again, language is limiting. And you talk about Wittgenstein too in the book. But I'm curious to sort of understand how you try to 
make sense of it or find, make peace with it because I do think that one must make peace with it in order mm -hmm. to live a, a life that isn't full of suffering. Yeah, I mean, well, I would love to hear what you think of it too at some point, but I guess my answer to that question is I don't think currently, and my belief on my, my thoughts are changing all the time, but I currently don't know that I'm ever going to really understand what's going on beyond you know what I have access to through my first person point of view, which is very limited. I've always been fascinated by mystical experiences, by near-death experiences, by these experiences that many, many people have had that don't seem to fit within our explanations, our modern explanations of the world. And, you know, I have, I've done meditation, I've undergone hypnosis, I've, you know, experimented with a lot of things since leaving the church and have never really had that immediate experience of something transcendent in my life. And I don't know why that is. You know, it was the same as I was a Christian. You know, a lot of people would talk about God speaking to them or, you know, having these sort of supernatural seeming experiences. And I always felt like there was, you know, something wrong with me that I wasn't able to to access that reality. But I do have the sense of there being something bigger, I guess, just because of what you mentioned, like, you know, the way that when you read a book, there's something there that you're experiencing beyond just the language itself the fact that we can be emotionally affected by things. I guess just in thinking about that quote you read from my book, you know, I, I think I've moved a little bit closer toward existentialism since writing the book that I do think that we as humans have to determine what has meaning as opposed to getting it from, you know, from expecting that it can be given to us through revelation or through a mystical experience or through you know, any sort of transcendent perspective. But I think the thing that I was missing when I felt that, the thing I was writing about in the book, that feeling of, I don't want to give life some private meaning. Mm. I think that's the problem is trying to give it an individualist private meaning. I think that the most meaningful things that I've found in my life have been collective sources of meaning. Mm. You know, I've gotten really involved in 12-step in groups since getting sober. And I, that's something that you know, it is in some ways a spiritual program and it involves certain spiritual disciplines, but it's something that a community has, you know, there's some sort of consensus, human consensus about we're doing this thing together. And for me, that's been more just in terms of like a day to day practical way to live. That's been more helpful than trying to sort of access those unusual metaphysical experiences. But I still remain really fascinated by them. Yeah. What amazes me also is the uniformity and the continuity of some elemental concern of mankind for this profound mystery. Mm -hmm. You know, this is why I said, you know, when I read your book that I found it weirdly comforting mm -hmm. because here's yet another person who's been through this, mm -hmm. you know, and it, what is it we're all touching here? I guess my sense of it is, and this is actually a good opportunity also to get into Ray Kurzweil, who's like a really big part of the book, and in particular his book, uh, The Age of Spiritual Mach Machines, which he wrote before The Singularity is Near. I think he published it in the late 90s. Yeah, I think it was 1998, Eight, I, believe. I believe. Yeah, Or no, 99. Sorry, it was 99. Yeah. 99. And the reason I brought up Ray Kurzweil is because Ray Kurzweil and other patternists and transhumanists believe that consciousness, if we think of it in informational terms, is a pattern in the same way that uh, ripples on the water are a pattern and that this carries the information of our identity. This is the compressed essence of who we are. While there's something compelling about that, I think it's important to clarify what we mean by consciousness. Is consciousness tied up with self or is consciousness more expansive? You know, Joseph Campbell, in his interview series with Bill Moyers, towards the end of his life, talked about how as he gets older, he tries to identify not with the bulb that carries the light, but with the light of which the bulb is a vehicle. That feels very true to me because I don't believe that our egos survive our deaths. In other words, I, don't, I don't believe that the pattern survives, but I do think that there is a kind of continuity of consciousness that we are one with and that isn't affected by death or entropy. And my sense is that 
this is revealed to us somehow when we die. And this was something that I came to believe through my own revelatory experiences and that I've seen in the lives of other people who have been through something similar. For example, something I've talked about on the podcast before are patients from the NYU psilocybin study who were dying of cancer and through this combination of psychedelic treatment and guidance lost all fear of death. I mean, what what do you make of that? I mean, of of an authoritative experience like that, that is so powerful. How do you process that from a materialist perspective? Yeah. I mean, I'm fascinated by those experiences. I read somewhere that, you know, people who, who sort of study mystical experiences, one of the defining characteristics that is almost universal is the feeling that the truth or the love that's experienced is beyond a doubt, right? And I think you yes. use that language too, that there's no way you can doubt it. It's the sense of certainty. I felt, just to add to that, I felt, especially after my brain surgery, I felt this deep level of certainty such that I had no desire to really talk to anyone else about it. I didn't need to anyone else to believe it. It didn't even come in that form. It just, it was a revelation. Mm. It, it, I really understood what that word meant for the first time in my life. In fact, there were a lot of words that I understood immediately, intuitively. And another experience that I had after my, first of all, I had, this makes me think of Julian James's The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of oh, the Bicameral yeah. Mind. Wild book. But, uh, I had. Great. I had voices in my head when I, it makes me wonder a little bit, maybe this is probably, I don't know what this was, but I had a single voice in my head right after I came out of brain surgery, which was an answer to a question that I asked right before I was headed into, when I was being wheeled into surgery, about to be put under. And the answers were, I said, well, you know, what's the point of all this? Like, why is this happening to me? Like, I did everything right. Like, I thought I, I did what I was supposed to do in here. This is my punishment. And it's, there's a bit more context to all that. But the answers were love and gratitude. Mm. And I, I remember they were like cassette tapes. It's what it felt like. It was like a cassette tape that had been put on my head and was just on repeat, love and gratitude, love and gratitude. And I, I said at the time and I wrote at the time that I, I knew what love was. I really didn't know what gratitude was until then. And the rest of my life, to this day, I feel an immense amount of gratitude for all the things that, you know, for everything really, <laughs> you know, even suffering is... I feel gratitude. You know, I was in a, a few years after that, I had a breakup and I, you know, it was really painful. And I remember feeling like immense gratitude mm. for the heartbreak. I remember holding my heart and being, just feeling, like just breathing out and being, whew, to be able to feel that so deeply. And I also felt called. I had all these feelings of being called. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I was called to do was watch a specific set of movies, including The Matrix, by the way. And when I saw The Matrix, you know, I'd seen The Matrix when I was a young guy. And like a lot of people that age, you know, I connected with the hero character, the hero journey, blah, blah. But the second time I saw The Matrix, you know, the architect and all the sort of interesting stuff. I also had the Matrix trilogy where Chalmers had his long hair and he was being interviewed and Cornell West was being interviewed. You can't get that digitally. You have to actually order on Amazon now. They don't have it anywhere. Huh. And it was the story of Neo and Trinity that I fixated on. Anyway, I can't quite tell you just how fortunate I feel to have had that experience. And that's a whole other sort of onion to peel on its own. But my point is that that experience taught me that I had to feel my, at least for me, you know, I speak with total humility here, that we have to feel our way mm. to that truth, to that timeless vision, that our hearts have to be part of that journey that we can't simply be this sort of disconnected brain in a vat and kind of reason our way towards something and that that's a trap, which is incidentally why, and now we'll bring us back to this conversation about transhumanism and Ray Kurzweil and the age of spiritual machines, which is why I ultimately feel that the transhumanist community, and I don't mean this in a judgmental way, in sort of biblically judgmental, but it feels evil. There's something evil and diabolical about convincing yourself that you can capture the essence of who you are, this consciousness, as an informational thing and transfer it to another medium. Mm. And, you know, I'll just add one more thing because I don't want to take credit for it because you sent me an interview that you did and boy, was that interviewer not great. He asked a bunch of questions I wouldn't have even thought of. And one of that I just thought was so profound 
you guys were talking about the alignment problem in artificial intelligence. Again, I recommend people check out the related section to this week's episode page. You can find our episodes with uh, Eric Schmidt from Google or Mustafa Suleiman from DeepMind or other people in, in the field of AI, if you want to know what that is. And I always recommend Nick Bostrom's book, Super Intelligence, to sort of think about the complex intersection of epistemology and normative philosophy, applied philosophy, for what we're talking about here. But you guys are talking about the alignment problem, and uh, he made this like brilliant point about how the things that matter most to us are things that we experience because we are mortal beings with bodies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, like he talked about courage. You know, how do you understand courage if you don't have a heart? Mm -hmm. So I threw a lot of stuff out there. Feel free to respond to it, <laughs> and then maybe I can bring us some specific, more less meandering questions on transhumanism, because I think this is a really interesting conversation. I yeah, no, there's so much there. I, what struck me is what, it seems like what you're talking about with transhumanism is this incredibly dualistic way of thinking of the mind as the, that something that can be disembodied or sort of abstracted from the body, right? Yeah, dualistic, but I would say that dualism still values the body in a way that transhumanism doesn't. Transhumanists almost see it as a, a kind of burden, that the body is this imperfect vessel for this signal of consciousness, which is still fundamentally material and therefore still accountable to the second law of thermodynamics. And they presume to understand it well enough, at least in informational terms, in sort of syntactic terms, to capture it and save it to a hard drive or some other medium. You know, that's what Kurzweil seems to believe when he talks about resurrecting his dad. But even he acknowledges that he isn't resurrecting his father as much as he's replicating the signal that produces the phenomenon that he experiences as his father. It's almost like in this belief system, in order to resurrect somebody or someone, you have to consign their soul to some material essence. You have to demean it somehow. You have to turn it into this material thing that you can then copy because otherwise it falls outside the realm of what you can manipulate. And that just seems like a trap. And I, I say it's evil because I, I feel like it's the devil's work, that if the devil wanted to trick people into losing their way to God, to this infinite expanse of love, this would be a great way of accomplishing it, by tricking them into believing that the way to immortality is to sublimate themselves to this material view of consciousness, which cannot even be substantiated in the final analysis. It's not something that can be proven and has no scientific basis whatsoever. Does that depiction resonate with you at all? Yeah, I mean, that's the fundamental lie, I think, of transhumanism or any of these sort of techno-utopian ideas about immortality. You know, it's, it's sold under this idea of transcendence. We're going to, you know, I think Kurz will even use this, the term divinization at some point, right? We're going to ascend into this higher form of post-humanity. We're going to become like gods, by which he means omniscient, omnipotent, immortal. When you, you know, if you get into like the really nitty gritty of the age of spiritual machines or some other transhumanist writers where they talk about sort of the details and logistics of mind uploading, at some point, all of them, especially Kurzweil, I remember at one point, he acknowledges, well, okay, let's say that you take the pattern of your consciousness, you map it, you put it onto a supercomputer. You might, if the technology is very good, have a chatbot or some sort of software program that behaves exactly like you, that you know talks like you, that has the same, same preferences and inclinations as you, that claims to have first-person experience the way that even some chatbots now do. But will that machine actually have experience, right? Will that be connected to what we think of today as what makes us human, you know, the ability to have that perspective on the world? And he admits, well, there's no way we can know that, right? And to me, that was the point of the book where he sort of just walks away from that question. I'm like, no, that's the whole thing. Like, this is not transcendence. This is not divinization. If this is about humans turning into machines, you know, if you think about the old, I mean, even the title of my book is sort of an allusion to the old medieval scala natura, this idea that there's a hierarchy of beings. You know, this is, goes back to Aristotle. At the very top is God and the angels, and then we have humans who are made in the image of God. Lower down the scale, you have animals, plants, and in, at the very bottom of that scale is inanimate objects, including human-made instruments. So, you know, if machines were included in that medieval worldview, 
they would be at the very bottom of the scale. To me, you know, I, I think there's a lot of problems with that hierarchy. Also, you know, obviously we put ourselves at the, at the top as humans, but you know, I think there is something intuitive about the idea that to become a machine is to lose something, mm. it's to lose something, the most important thing about being human. And I do think that we need a body to experience that. I mean, our, our emotions, I think we need a history in the world. We need, you know, experience. And I think what frustrates me in a lot of these sort of mind uploading hypotheses is the idea that the body is dispensable, that it could be a computer, it could be mm. an android of some sort, it could be a mechanical body. And I don't know, I, I sometimes attribute that to my Christian background too, because for Christianity, the body is really important when it comes to resurrection. I think there's this, this misconception that in Christianity, you know, religious people tend to deny the body, that it's all about, you know, the soul or the spirit. But Christians really believe that the resurrection was going to have to resurrect the entire body. And this influenced everything from, you know, burial practices for many centuries. In England, I think up until the early 19th century, it was illegal to dismember a corpse even for scientific reasons, because it was believed that you needed an intact body in order to rise again. So I think the technological theories about either digital resurrection or digital immortality, they really do miss something if they're not taking that, that holistic human experience into account. Yeah. You know, the other thing I, I want to say, and then I'll, I'll move to the second hour, is that these transhumanist ideas about consciousness uploading also presume that immortality in a physical form is necessarily better than putting your faith in a process that is natural and consistent with how every form of life we have knowledge of has come and gone from this earth. And that it's preferable to be ensconced in some kind of physical form rather than to experience what could be your actual destiny and a more expansive form of consciousness. In other words, you're allowing your fear of death to limit the boundlessness, the potential boundlessness of your consciousness, if that makes any sense. Again, it's another way of expressing what I said earlier about this philosophy feeling like a trap. I'm going to move us to the second part of this conversation, Megan, and I want to try and find a way to ground what has until now been a more philosophical discussion into the practical realm of artificial intelligence and how these ideas factor into the engineering challenges and the political choices that are and will have to be made. We also didn't talk much about secular disenchantment and whether the proliferation of connected devices is re-enchanting the world. So that's something else I'd like to talk to you about. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second hour of today's conversation with Megan, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and sign up to one of our three content tiers. All subscribers gain access to our premium feed, which you can use to listen to the rest of today's conversation on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. Megan, stick around. We're going to move the rest of our conversation onto the premium feed. If you want to listen in on the rest of today's conversation, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and join our premium feed. If you want to join in on the conversation and become a member of the Hidden Forces Genius Community, you can also do that through our subscriber page. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stilianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. You can follow me on Twitter at Kofinas, and you can email me at info at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.